So we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I know some people have things they have to go to at 1230. This is going to be more of an informal get together. So if you need to leave, we totally understand. But we're so glad to have you. Um, my name is Lauren McLean, and I'm a faculty member in political science. I know most, many of you. Um, I'm also now a department chair in political science and a longtime affiliate. Um, some people are plotting, some people are giving me sad faces. <laughs> the ones who know. Um, not my department, just the job, I mean. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we are very excited to be here. Um, I've been a long time affiliate of the workshop since I came to IU in 2005. And Lynn really was a mentor to me as an assistant professor um, and, and kind of on up uh, through the ranks. So um, it was really exciting when I heard the organizers of this event. So I want to um, uh, put a shout out to Dan Cole and Aurelian Cryutu. Um, also, my colleagues, uh, Bill Bianco, Regina Smith, and Will Weinkoff, who <coughs> applied for a grant from the Ocean Workshop for a whole series of sort of celebrations and recognition of the legacy of Lynn Ostrom 10 years after she got the Nobel Prize. And some of those events have been sort of very intellectual kinds of exchanges um, with uh, I don't want to say outsiders, but people who are not necessarily directly connected to the Ostrom workshop that have sort of taken up or engaging with some of the big questions um, that Lynn engaged with over the years. Um, we also wanted to have an event that was more about the community building in the workshop and sort of about the mentorship. And we thought, what better way to do that than to invite some longtime Ostrom Workshop um, members and continued members um, who were former students of Lynn. Um, and immediately came upon the names <coughs> of Adela Schlager um, and Gwen Arnold, who are joining me here today for this roundtable. Um, so I want to introduce uh, each of them, and then I will uh, they'll take about 20 minutes to kind of share some of their personal experiences and thoughts, and then we'll open it up to sort of more of an informal roundtable kind of a discussion. Um, so I'll help facilitate that discussion. Um, but Adela was a PhD student in the political science department um, and finished in 1990, um, and has since been at the University of Arizona, where she is now the director, I think the proper name would really be the dean, of this new school of government and public policy that's really bringing in it's sort of a new imagination of how several of the social sciences and public affairs can all come together. Um, so she's really institution building at Arizona. Um, and she has um, a number of books and articles, a lot on water policy, has collaborated a lot with other workshoppers like Bill Blumquist. Um, and you've probably seen her face over the years at WOW um, workshop on the workshop conferences over the years. Um, so we're delighted to have her. Um, we're also delighted to have Gwen Arnold, um, who is a more recent PhD, and she was a PhD student in the joint program on public policy, um, which has since been suspended, but we hope might have a new life um, in the future. Um, and Gwen is at the University of California at Davis, and she's in the environmental science and policy department there, and has what looks like a very dynamic lab, and a lot of um, really great colleagues at Davis, um, and is continuing to do some really exciting work um, from Davis. So we're really glad to have you back at IU. Um, and we look forward to uh, hearing some of your thoughts. I think Adela is going to go first. Mm -hmm. is that right? That's the plan. Okay. Good. Good. Uh -huh. So I'm delighted to be here, and I was really excited when I first received the invitation to uh, come and and speak about Lynn and how Lynn was a mentor to me, and um, I think really to all of her students. And um, it just made me. Uh, 
I think of being in this room, I was thinking about the last time I was in this room. Uh, I participated in a colloquium, um, gosh, but I bet it's been almost 12 years ago now. And, oh, okay, so now I'm over that little nostalgic piece. And I have all, all these happy memories flowing back. But um, what Lauren did uh, before this uh, gathering was to send Gwen and I um, a handful of questions to think about to sort of flesh out this notion of Lynn as mentor and thank you very much. They were really helpful and um, in looking them over and thinking about them, they really fell into three, I would say, large categories and that's pretty much what I'm going to uh, sort of focus my remarks around and uh, try to tie it all together. And those categories uh, centered around education and training, um, administration, uh, how to run an organization, and also then, of course, scholarship and research. And in thinking about Lynn and the workshop, because it's really hard to separate those two, those three things all are woven together really tightly through Lynn. And so I'm going to talk about those different dimensions of Lynn's mentorship in terms of teaching and research and administration. And in talking about that, also my experiences here at the workshop because they all fit together. And so those are the different, at least three of the different dimensions of Lynn's mentorship. They all get woven together sort of in this really colorful and complex tapestry that's called the workshop but that the primary weaver of that tapestry was Lynn. And there was a structure to that tapestry, a foundational part that explains, for me anyway, in my experience, really explains Lynn's mentorship and really explains her teaching, her research, and how she ran the workshop. And that foundational piece, and you guys aren't going to be surprised by this, we might be using different language, but that foundational piece was <laughs> self-governance. That the individual, every person, is capable of being a governor. Their own self-governor, but also engaging in self-governance with others. <laughs> and that is such, I think, for me anyway, a critical piece of making sense of working with Lynn and being a friend of hers over the years and then my entire experience of the uh, workshop. So everybody who came into the workshop participated in weaving that tapestry, but it was really uh, Lynn and Vincent who uh, guided that. And, and help structure it. So this notion of self-governance and being your own governor, and it was really about relationship and how do we relate to one another and how can we relate to one another in a productive way or in productive ways to really create something bigger and better than ourselves. So that's just foundational to everything Lynn did was this notion of self-governance and relationship based on respect and dignity and uh, uh, working together. <clears throat> so I, um, I know that sounds maybe sort of superficial or yeah, of course, this is what they did. Um, but uh, the more years <laughs> that pass, the more I realize just how foundational that was to everything that uh, Lynn did. And um, so even now as director of a large unit, I often catch myself thinking, WWLD, <laughs> all right? <laughs> what would Lynn do in this? And, and it saved me <laughs> on a number of occasions, and I can touch on those in a minute. So um, I think what I'll do is just give you some examples of how this notion of self-governance uh, permeated the workshop because of Lynn and Vincent. And by giving you maybe a snapshot of what it was like to be a graduate student here 
in the mid to late 80s. And what um, a young scholar, a young female scholar, experienced and encountered in uh, walking into the workshop. And um, when I come back and talk to people who've been at the workshop for a long time, or I meet people at conferences who've been tied to the workshop, the very first thing, or one of the very first things we talk about is the staff. And Patty, I hope she's enjoying retirement, <laughs> and you know, Gail, and back in the day there was Linda, and um, uh, Julie who did uh, computer work for us. The staff were integral to this enterprise. They were a part of it. They were not here to serve us. They had their roles, just like as graduate students, we had our roles, but it was all working together and making this thing happen. And so, um, sorry. So, um, you know, I wouldn't have made it through my graduate career without the assistance and support of Patty and Gail and Linda. And in fact, um, I was just thinking about this uh, this morning. I defended my dissertation in early July of 1990, and I moved to Tucson about two weeks later. There's no way I could have submitted my dissertation, right, and had the university approve it and grant me my diploma unless Patty was there. She agreed to help me with those final, this was before the <laughs> internet largely, with those final revisions to get that submitted. So we were all part of part of a team. Doesn't mean that there weren't struggles or anything, but but we were not, as graduate students, we weren't allowed to treat staff as anything other than an equal participating in this uh, effort. The other, um, Thing that I would uh, point out is um, every, you know, that kind of approach permeated everything. Another very early memory I had, and it was in this room, was stepping into this room probably within the first couple of months of being a graduate student here. And there was Lynn and Jim Wunsch, who was here on sabbatical, and Bill Bunquist. And they were all struggling with trying to develop a coding form. How do we code the critical features of a common pool of resource? And they were just starting that process. And I remember sitting here just thinking, huh? <laughs> but right, they were working together collaboratively. And for two years, Lynn's research team, uh, us graduate students, uh, Kang and Bill and me, we struggled with developing these coding, the CPR coding forms. And um, on, you know, on some weekends, I live south of here, on some weekends, Lynn would be here at the workshop and then she would drop by my house on her way home so that we could sit for another hour or two and work on the coding forms. And so we'd huddle around my kitchen table and I had a couple of tasks and you know, they'd be roaming around, but we'd be working together and and puzzling over how can we get this one question right. For Lynn, right, we were all part of the team. We were part of the work, and it didn't matter if she met us at our house or if we worked here at the workshop or where that happened, but the work that we were doing was important. So that was, uh, <laughs> those are all fond memories of working with Lynn. But then also um, teaching. Right, so the workshop seminars happen, I don't know if they still happen in this room, but they happen in this room. And notice how this room is set up, right? So we sit around in a circle and it was all of us. It was graduate students, it was all of the visiting scholars, and there were some great visiting scholars then that were a blast to hang out with. It was uh, Phil Sabetti, my very first espresso <laughs> was made by Phil Sabetti in that kitchen. There was a Bronco Smyrtle, 
from, I forget where, in Eastern Europe. But that was right when the wall was falling and there was all this excitement about the possibility of democracy. There was Amos Sawyer and uh, the work on constitutions in Africa. So there were the visiting scholars, there was the students, there were other faculty members, and we all sat around the same table, right, elbow to elbow, working through this material, really puzzling over how do you engage in self-governance around public goods or common pool resources. And, and um, so that was, um, that was quite an experience. But really, and I think we all know this, it was really the many conferences, right, <laughs> that uh, also demonstrated this notion of how do you train young scholars into working together over a puzzle. And so um, the very first mini conference, really honest to God, I think that my first semester, Lynn didn't think I was gonna make it. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, it was overwhelming, first semester graduate school of like, oh my you know, what are they talking about? And really, especially Vincent, it's like, does anybody <laughs> right, understand what Vincent is saying? <laughs> and um, and uh, so, you know, engaging with this and trying to figure things out and just like feeling really overwhelmed. But, you know, the format of a mini conference is you present one another's work. And the importance of that is that you have to sympathetically step into the shoes of another scholar and figure out what they're trying to do, right? Before you start giving them advice about maybe they should think about this or maybe you should think about that. And uh, I presented somebody's paper, I don't remember what, and I saw this look on Lynn's face like, oh, almost a relief, right? It's like, oh, she got it. <laughs> and then after that, things seemed to go just fine, right? But, but there was that kind of um, you know, camaraderie or working together and, and really taking one another seriously as a scholar and really digging into each other's work. I still do that today with my students. That's how I structure my PhD seminars. We all sit around in a circle. We're all you know, engaging with the material. And at the end of the semester, we have a mini conference. And we're presenting one another's work because too often, I think, in academia, we're quick to criticize and to say, or to point out how the work that you're doing is wrong or what you try to do there is wrong, 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 right? Instead of really trying to step back and figure out, what are you trying to do? And if I understand what you're trying to do, then how might you, or what kind of constructive advice can I give you to do it better? And so that's something that I've always carried with me my entire career. Um, I guess the other thing, and it builds on that, is what Lynn really trained her students into was to take a problem-solving perspective. I can't tell you how distinctive and unique that is. So, right, if we sat in this room and we puzzled over different topics. We sat in this room and worked on developing coding forms and, and gathering data. But it was always from a problem solving and puzzling over perspective. And how can we solve these problems? And usually, or the effort was to start from what people, real people, on the ground are struggling with and how they're trying to address it and that was your starting point and then from there you worked out that is uh, not common and it's still not as common as it should be today so I've had the great fortune uh, very early on in my career of uh, working with Paul Sabatier who was a public policy scholar at UC Davis and um, he and Lynn knew each other really pretty well they, uh, Lynn and Vincent uh, did a sabbatical at Bielefeld not too long before I arrived here as a graduate student. And I've heard many stories about their time in Bielefeld. Vincent and Paul argued a lot. Um, Lynn and Paul uh, got along a little bit better and had some conversations and in fact, if you take a look at the framework that Paul developed, 
it has some really clear similarities to the IAD framework. So I know that there is some, some interaction there. But anyway, Paul got me into the whole area of public policy studies and to a number of scholars and work that was being done in public policy. So there's Paul Sabatier and Hank Jenkins Smith and there's Frank Baumgartner and um, Brian Jones and a bunch of other people who were developing theories of policy making processes at that, this time. And so I got into that community as well as the workshop community. And um, <laughs> what most of this other work, the starting point for it is policy elites. So who matters in trying to understand or explain policy making processes for a number of these other approaches? It's you start with policy elites and you figure out how they try to work the system or shape the system to try to get some legislation out or some policy out, right? That is so different from the work that Lynn engaged in. So about four or five years ago, one of Paul's students <coughs> wanted to put together a special issue of a journal on how do policy process theories, how can they speak to people's circumstances? And with the IAD, right, that's a slam dunk. I think anybody in this room, you could just sit down and here it is. This is how it works, no matter what the example is, right? But other scholars really struggle with this. They'll start talking about interest groups, or they'll start talking about some epistemic communities. And then eventually, maybe at some point, they can work their way down to the level of where people are, are struggling. So. Um, that's always been the approach also that has carried through with my career is that you start with a problem and it's usually a problem or a set of problems on the ground. Um, and, and I guess that's sort of how the workshop has been set up is in that same way that we puzzle over things together as an academic community and, um, and we uh, contribute to this uh, shared good that's the workshop. Um, being the director of a large uh, school, we have about 2,200 majors. We have eight different uh, degree programs, but we're one faculty. We're not divided up into different uh, departments or different groups. We view ourselves as one, and we're all contributing to all of these different programs. I would say that without Lynn's background and training, I think that it would have been really hard for me to step into this position, to uh, engage in this experiment, because we all know, right, that not only do political scientists sometimes not get along well, but then add in public policy scholars, public management scholars, sociologists, and economists, and try to get right one group of faculty working together. But um, really taking Lynn's approach that we're all self-governors, and we all have something to contribute, and we all have and share different gifts that we can bring forward to uh, contribute to this a common enterprise is something that I draw on uh, quite often. So uh, in the end, Lynn as mentor, um, Lynn was critical. Right now, we often think of Lynn as not being critical. Lynn was critical of a number of things. She was critical of power structures that blocked or hindered people's ability to engage in self-governance. So throughout her career, she had a long line of critique around bureaucracies and bureaucratic systems. She had a long line of critique around standard policy analysis approaches. She was critical. That isn't the first thing you think about with her, but she was critical about these different power structures that hindered 
uh, people engaging in self-governance. And she offered an alternative. The workshop was an alternative to show a different way of educating and engaging in the research enterprise from a typical academic approach. How she treated people was different. But in the end, and I think there was an implication to uh, Ostrom as a mentor to women scholars, I think in that question, there's an implication that maybe Lynn was a feminist. And I would say I never experienced Lynn as a feminist. I experienced Lynn as really an important mentor and advocate for her students, women and men. And she would um, develop lifelong relationships with us and she would be there for us. So I was a friend, I considered her a friend of mine until the day she died. She helped me get my job at Arizona. <coughs> she wrote letters for my promotion cases. She was there to consult with on any major decision. She was always there for me. But I know that she was always there for my male colleagues as well who were being trained in. So I took way too much time. I'm happy to answer any questions after we get, or until, or at the point we get here. Yeah, so why don't we go to Gwen? Yes. Um, and I appreciate all of your comments. And you already highlighted a lot of the tensions, I think, between um, sort of hierarchy and power structures and the way they may have been inverted in certain ways um, and challenged uh, in everyday practice. Um, Gwen? Yeah. Um, I'll begin by saying I'm still, so I graduated in 2012, and I'm still figuring out all the ways that the workshop was so distinctive. Um, when when you're in it, or at least if you're me, and you, I didn't know any people who were professors, like, and so that I'm going to graduate school, and I I didn't know it wasn't like this other places. Right? <laughs> I I didn't have friends in other <clears throat> graduate programs. I only had them here, and so it it wasn't until maybe when I met some people at conferences, but not really that. It wasn't until later that I was like, oh, it's not like this. You know? And I remember I I applied for this the job at UC Davis. Um, I had a job at Cincinnati just for a year, and everyone request at, at CB was like, you should apply for this job. I was like, I hate that job. It's like, no, apply for this one. It's better. That's where Paul Scott DA was. I was like, okay. Um, but when I went and interviewed, <gasps> hey, Jared. When I went and interviewed, I, um, I printed out one of Mark LaBelle's papers. He's a like, you know, big guy in that department. And on the plane, like, I wrote some critiques on it. I wrote some comments on it. And I, you know, and I didn't get a chance to talk to him about it. So, well, when I left, I just put this marked up paper with all these comments in it in this mailbox. So I was like, okay, he's gonna probably want this. <laughs> they will appreciate this. <laughs> and I didn't know that that was a thing that might not have been normal. <laughs> 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 I was like, don't people get people instructive? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Don't people give people feedback? Don't they want that? Mm -hmm. I just didn't know. Uh, and so, I mean, I, yeah, the workshop was very special. So I'm, I'm gonna try to organize um, in, in three sort of domains, if I can tell it, it's sort of around scholarship and community and care, and it was distinctive in all of those ways. And, and the first one gets to that that idea of, of, of critique. It's really, I mean, the whole notion of a workshop. It, it Lynn and Vincent talked about how you know, these, they built these tables, and they built the filing cabinets, and they built the chairs, not these chairs, but they built some <laughs> chairs, right? And because, and they were inspired to build the workshop because they viewed scholarship as craftsmanship. And you're always getting better. It's not one and done. You know, you're always sort of learning and refining your ideas, and you're willing to challenge ideas that you held previously and sort of look at them a different way, turn them around, code them differently, find a way that makes more sense. And I mean, craftsmen, craftspeople, they don't work alone. Right? They work in guilds. They they work together. And so it makes sense that a workshop is not just people in their offices doing things and you know typing things it's 
working together on coding forms and, and iteratively trying to understand what is the best way to do this. And so this idea of craftsmanship and being a true workshop, I think really, I mean, it pervaded everything. When, when we had the seminars, I, I was a student, so it was going to be my job. Well, at first, you had to read the paper beforehand because how else could you ask a question? How else could you engage constructively? And it was going to be my job at least once to ask the first question. So I had to make sure that I understood what was going on, so I was prepared to ask that first question at seminar. And we were expected <coughs> to, I mean, yes, I had to ask that first question, but we were also just sort of expected to engage. And we wrote memos based on what the, pre what the presenter said, and we sort of engaged with them. And then Lynn wrote us a memo back. It wasn't just sort of a thing that she was like, okay, cool, great. <laughs> she read it, and then she had comments, and then she sent them to you. And I, again, I didn't know how, I mean, I knew that she, I liked her work, right? That's why I came, but I didn't know how prominent she was, not really. I didn't know anything about academia. So I didn't know that Lynn spending time to write me a memo back was an investment of her time that I, that at another institution, this would not have happened. I, I didn't know that, but it, in retrospect, it's, it's really, it's really remarkable that it's something that I try to do with my own students. I don't always succeed, but I try to say, if you sent me something, I'm really going to engage with it. Um, so that, that norm of engagement, the, the critique, the constructive critique, the mini conference, I mean, again, so, so central. So Abby York and I, she's at ASU, um, this is gonna be our second year at the Western Political Science Association actually holding a mini conference. Um, where people present other people's papers. And I think people overall liked it. It was weird, right, for, for, a, for a political science conference to do this very different thing. We, had, uh, we have one or two people who didn't realize that they were in the mini conference despite all the emails, and they were like really freaked out, and then, they, and then the people had to, there was one session where the people had to present their own paper because the other people didn't prepare them. So it's a little bit hard. I mean, and it showed us, though, that we thought that we had, you know, we thought that we had presented what this was going to be and what you should do, but we have to work even harder to establish those norms because we're not all coming up from the workshop. But we wanted to, to do it because it's such, it's such a valuable experience for you to hear what your work looks like to someone else and to, to understand what they get and what they don't get. And for you as a presenter to really read this paper and know that you're not writing some anonymous review. <coughs> you are going to be there in person providing comments. So what do you want to give in that you know, really considered face-to-face -face kind of way? What do you want to do to help that person improve? I mean, and that was that improvement and that working together and the face-to-face -face kind of engagement that was just so central. I mean, that relates, of course it relates to the broader idea of what, what were we doing at the workshop? One of the things that I really remember and that I try to impress upon my students now is, is the importance of theory. Now, I'm in an environmental science and policy department, so a lot of times people come and they're like, I care about the rivers, like, and I care about like, the trees. And I'm like, that's good, <laughs> but what if you switch from rivers to trees later? Like, how are, you going to, how are you going to carry whatever you've learned with the rivers to the trees? Like, the way that you do that is theory. This is how we know whether this thing we learned over here generalizes to this thing over here or this thing over here. So we need theory. We need this basic understanding of how people behave and what are the rules and norms and strategies that they deploy. What are the kinds of institutions do they, that they build and how do they build them? And once we have an understanding of that, or at least an understanding, we know how to inquire about that, then we can look at the rivers and the trees and the squirrels and whatever it is that you want to look at. And that, that was the workshop for me. The other, made, the other thing that has really guided my work, um, it was hard to understand Vincent verbally or written down. Like, I, I mean, there were those like, sentences that were par paragraphs or sentences. I was like, I don't know what's happening here. But one thing that I really do remember, somebody at the mini con or like, a presenter, would talk about the state. Or, right? or would talk about the government. And he would be like, what is the state? What is the government? There is no state. There is no government. There are individuals who are guided by rules, who are making choices. And I think I really internalized that. Um, because I, at this right now, what I really study are those micro foundations. We see things happening in, the policy, in policy systems. We see governments. We see a city making a decision. But a city doesn't do anything. Right? 
uh, the state doesn't do anything. It's people making choices guided by rules. And so I urge my students to study those micro level foundations to understand these macro level political phenomena. It also guided me to study policy entrepreneurship. Sort of if we want to understand how people are working together, well, let's also look at the people who are strategically really working hard to change systems and really working hard to change people's minds so as to get them on board with, with changing a system. And in thinking about this, um, this talk, I went and looked back and um, I read some stuff that Lynn had written about entrepreneurship. And um, then I went back and I looked at her dissertation, right, on public entrepreneurship. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe there was some sort of root here. And the chapter, the chapter, sorry, I'm going to get emotional. The chapter that um, she was reading when she died of mine was on policy entrepreneurship, and I got it back afterwards because she had it at the hospital. And it was, it, so it's been a really, that's, that was hard, right? Um, but understanding the micro foundations, understanding the strategic behavior that people engage in to try to effectuate change, and understanding how the, that strategic behavior interfaces with institutions, all of that can help you understand whatever phenomena that you want to understand in the natural world or, or outside the natural world. Um, I have students who study like coastal systems and how uh, tribes interact with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California and fracking and resilience of cities. And I'm like, I, this is great. Like, I'm glad that you bring all these diverse ideas to the table. But, and we can use the same theory to understand these things. And the workshop really taught me that. I think also, um, so moving to the community, I still work with a ton of workshoppers. I mean, I'm not that far out, but I mean, Rob Hallahan at Binghamton is one of my close collaborators. Forrest Fleischman and I in Minnesota, we just had a paper come out, or just got, it, got accepted. I've spent eight years working with Leanne Nguyen and Long. We met in my business policy process class. We still talk about it all the time. I mean, these are relationships that form because, because Lynn promoted those relationships. And because we had all these working groups, and we talked about the social ecological systems framework. And we talked about coding um, the design principles or recoding the design principles. Or we talked about uh, formal modeling and how it could relate to social ecological systems. I mean, some of these working groups didn't go anywhere. Sometimes they went in circles. Sometimes they produced papers. But the fact that they existed, that we had these opportunities to collaborate with one another regularly, consistently, has produced me now, right, where I collaborate regularly and consistently with people who have these sort of shared norms of, I'm going to engage constructively, I'm going to give you feedback, I'm going to be there, we're going to work on this. And that is so valuable. Um, and that's something, again, that I try to foster in my students. Um, and finally, Lynn really, I mean, she was distinctive in so many ways, of course. And sometimes when I think about being a mentor, I'm like, how do I even, what do I even, I have this. I can't get up at 3 or 4 a.m. and I can't, I, I can't, I don't know how to do all of this. So what do I do as a mentor? But the thing that that I can do is is care about my students and their well-being and really want to guide them towards whatever is the best outcome for them because I think that Lynn really did that. Um, we were talking about this last night. So after she won the Nobel, she was scheduled like two years out. Like her schedule or Nicole was like, she can't take any meetings until it's, until it's you know, two years. But she could still meet with me every two weeks about my dissertation. That was different because I was one of her students. And I mean, that, it, it, that was just how she engaged with her students. Once she made the commitment to a student, she was going to keep that commitment. Um, and she cared. There's so many anecdotes, right? And you must have so many of them. I, I remember one, and she, was, uh, she would tell me you know, we had conversations about work, and then she's like, but are you also saving money? Right? Are you also making sure that you put a little bit away every month? So, so later on, maybe when you go on the job market, you have some money for it to fly out, or you have some, some money for the summer. I was like, yeah, I'm saving. I wasn't very good at saving, but I'm like, yes, but I'm saving money. Right? Or uh, there was one time she was talking about the importance of sleep. I think if I look tired, I don't know that you woke up at 3 in the morning. But, but yeah, but she's like, you know, it's really important. And I, I mean, these kinds of things where she would, she would be such a great 
scholar, and she's, she's talking to somebody in Kenya, and she's off and on, and then she's like, oh, okay, well, let's talk about your dissertation and also those mosquito bites that you have on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it was, it was so amazing to have someone who cared on, on multiple levels, and she did that. And yeah, I mean, I don't think that in any of these ways, any of us could ever be them, but we can all we can all try to perpetuate some of these ideas and some of these ethos in our work, and I, I think we both try to do that. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to open it up to questions in a minute, but I wanted to sort of throw a, 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 a comment or a question out there, because from both of your talks, there's to me there's a lot of really interesting tensions between the importance of individuals individuals, microfinization, individual decision making, sort of individual autonomy, sort of recognition and validation of the importance of individuals, and self-governing, so those ideas, but then also the importance of community. Um, and then again, sort of the importance of thinking maybe in a, a more horizontal or flatter way and trying to challenge Power and hierarchies, um, but then thinking about sort of the leadership and vision of Lynn in trying to facilitate community or facilitate the workshop. Um, so I wondered if you had any thoughts about some of the tensions in all of the things that you're talking about and what was special. You ask easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she must have, but it just seemed like she was like, well, this is the puzzle. We're going to work on it. We can solve it. And thinking unconventionally, building the workshop to have a home that united political theory and empirical work in a way that it wasn't being done elsewhere. So she was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to build this workshop. We're going to make this new thing. Do you think that she thought of it as really distinctive, or do you think she was focused on the problem so much that she's like, well, this is the way that we do it. It seems like a good way to solve this problem. Let's try this. If it doesn't work, we'll try the next thing. I, I wonder. I answered your question with the question. Yeah, <laughs> that's true because she wasn't the type of person who I, she didn't lay out those conflicts and those tensions explicitly, mm -hmm. and um, and so that's I think that's one of the reasons why I said that um, um, she could be critical even though that isn't the first thing that you think of when uh, you think of Lynn. So, yeah, I think that there were a variety of tensions, both within the workshop and then between the workshop and uh, the larger external world. So I think uh, my understanding, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't here at the time that the workshop was created, but it was created, I think, in a, in the context of a lot of tension of uh, Lynn and Vincent having a different vision of what would be possible in academia and how students should be trained and how research should be engaged in, um, that the tension was great enough that they created the workshop and didn't remain exclusively within a department. So I think there was that type of tension. I think within the workshop, um, just because you puzzle over something together doesn't mean you agree on it. And um, <coughs> you could disagree and um, you could um, raise a variety of issues and questions, um, and that was um, supported and uh, encouraged. There are certain types of behavior, though, that you couldn't engage in, even if you were frustrated and you were sure that you were right and everybody else was wrong, right? So you couldn't, um, like, <laughs> well, it was discouraged to crush somebody. Right, to take somebody's head off. That all 
got to happen at some political science conference. on a panel. Can't we bring the economists here? <laughs> Um, and I think that um, I think that some people probably felt uncomfortable, and and uh, they would uh, leave. They would find someplace else that they found more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't want to gloss over that there was never any tension or or real like what's going on here. There was. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating that you're both sort of talking about how you kind of expected this is what academia was going to be like. You know, <laughs> in that case. I wonder if, you, if you're also not realizing how unusual Lynn was in the way she dealt with students, the way she mentored her students. When you talked about you had this regular two-week meeting with Lynn, which she perpetuated even after she was getting all this craziness about the Nobel Prize. Uh, but that was just her ordinary way. I mean, how involved was she <coughs> in your day-to-day -day sort of working on your dissertation project? My observation from the outside, I served on a lot of committees that, that uh, Lynn was chairing, she really knew what her students were doing. She really had a good track of what they were doing and, and, and how they were doing it. So could you say anything about that, about how she was able to engage with all of her students, I mean, you know, she's working with 15 or 16 uh -huh. students yeah. at a time, right? Uh, how was she able to do that? And get grants and publish. <laughs> <laughs> all the coffee she got. Yeah. 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 Came in for a problem one time, and he said, "Well, that's a good problem. Go figure it out." You know, uh, which actually was good advice at the time. I needed to sort of make a decision, but, but it was not this detailed sort of engagement. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that we had different experiences because because of, of, the, of the topics that we worked on. I, I ended up doing something. I would, got some grants to go work at EPA in Philly, and then I was just sort of the I was off there and doing things, interviewing people, but, she, but you're right, she always did know what was going on, and she always did respond to my emails, and she did read the chapters, and she gave me comments, and also she gave me like typographical comments, like there was, she was like, the comma shouldn't be here, I was like, oh, okay, I mean, but because but, she was reading that closely, <coughs> and the fact that she had so many students, and they were often doing very different things, I mean, I think that that, I, I think that that is the way it should be, because I think it enriches the workshop bring their experiences in different substantive areas and then that can help us understand whether the theory does extend to all these domains or are there are there areas that it doesn't and can we then refine the theory as a result. But as to how she did it, I don't know. I do know that it was it it was sometimes I would think sometimes that maybe she didn't know because I was off in Philly and then and then she would write something I'm like, oh, oh yeah, she she did know what was going on. I would, and what I, I agree with that, and uh, what I would add to that, <laughs> okay, it takes a village, <laughs> and uh, the workshop was the village. So uh, she was <coughs> a primary mentor, but then there were all these really uh, remarkable scholars here within the workshop that also took us under their wings and really helped us out a lot. I remember when I first, <laughs> well, first of all, I, it, hadn't, it didn't even occur to me to go out on the job market, right? I mean, this was such a warm and friendly and cozy and nurturing place. And so one day, oh, she said to me, you're ready. You know, it's time. Go, go find a job. <laughs> and this was, I don't know, halfway through my fourth year here. And I was like, mm. <laughs> okay. And, um, and so uh, uh, I lined up uh, two or three interviews. I didn't know what in God's name it meant to go on a job talk and to do anything like that. That wasn't part of the training <laughs> or the explicit training here at the workshop. And so luckily, 
Well, I think you guys can tell me if I was lucky or not. There was a visiting scholar here at the time named Rick Wilson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah a sketchy guy. <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. And, um, oh, you know, I would have never gotten a job if it hadn't been for Rick sitting me down and telling me this is what it's going to be like going out and doing a job interview and giving a job talk. And he made me give my, <laughs> these are the type of people that she surrounded herself with. And Rick was a student of hers before my time. He um, made me give my job talk to him at least 10 times before he finally said, okay, you're ready, you can do this. And um, so it was both um, Lynn, but also the people here who took an interest in us graduate students and helped us out. With Lynn, <laughs> when I was trying to write my dissertation prospectus, I came to her with the first draft and she looked at it and was like, oh, no, you're not doing that. <laughs> and basically, I couldn't think beyond the IAD framework. <clears throat> worth a darn to actually like ask an in interesting question <laughs> that was grounded in the framework. Right, and so I redid it, and I came back and said, here, and she's just like, oh, no. <laughs> I said, no the first time, <laughs> no this time. You're doing the same thing. You're just trying to convince me that you're not, <laughs> right? And so every time it happens, and fourth time it happens, and she's like, no, no. Um, and I'm like, tell me my question, <laughs> right? What, what's the question I should ask? And that's something that she wouldn't do. Once you settle on your research approach, then, she was with you all the way, but you had to figure that path that you were going to head down. Finally, I came across a paper that James Wilson, um, the uh, resource economist from Maine, who was part of the CPR project, had written, which was conceptual. And uh, I said, I can test this. I can empirically test the claims being made in this paper. And so I finally came back with, at her with that, and she's like, <sighs> Finally, <laughs> right? And then we worked hand in hand down those sets of questions. So I'm going to ask a question. Do you think it's just, it's changed? The university has changed. IU has changed. We, we don't have the resources. So you both talked about sort of a time intensiveness and iterativeness to people's scholarship and people coming in and, um, we just, we're in a time of budgetary austerity. We are pushing our PhD students out. So it's not like we're reminding them to go on the job market from day one. You gotta get ready to go on the job market. And we're pushing them out. They have few, lesser, fewer and fewer number of years um, that they have to sort of do this kind of exploration. And then, you know, this was a multidisciplinary, or is a multidisciplinary place, but we have so much budgetary competition. Like, there's a lot of incentives against units and schools cooperating or co-teaching, and we do it out of our goodwill, but not really rewarded for it. Like, maybe this is a, this is not possible. I think within the workshop it is, though, right? I mean, that was sort of the model that was set up. It's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, and. Uh, and so, um, sure, you're here doing your own work if you're a visiting scholar or if you're on the faculty here at Indiana, but you're also training the next generation. And if you weren't willing to do that, I don't think that you were that comfortable mm -hmm. at the workshop. I, I agree with you about how we really push our students, and I think it varies across what students are doing, like in comparative politics. The reason I was able to finish my dissertation in four years is that from the day I stepped on campus, I was gathering data that eventually turned into my dissertation. That wasn't what I intended to do, as we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. But I think that if you're gonna go out into the field and do field work and different things like that, I think that you're right. The, the pressure on these students must be tremendous.
I just wanted to, yeah. to um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a pl uh, kind of a, a plea, and that is, you know, I was thinking about all of Lynn's notes that she wrote on so many papers, and then she has to, she signs them Lynn and puts a little smiley face. Yeah. But when I was looking through the archives her, um, at the Lilly Library, which is kind of, they're kind of a mess because they didn't understand her research. But um, one of the things that's missing are all those personal communications from Lynn. And what I, and I just wanted to, to, to kind of jump in and say, so every one of you that has the, has papers where, you know, and probably, I mean, for me, I have like, but you know, um, and 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 Gwen and 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 Adela, Mike and Dan and and I mean, there's so many you'll have. Think about these as archives that need to be shared at some point. You know, make copies or um, or just you know make sure that they go to to the collection so that at some point people can just see her amazing generosity of, and focus of time and, and I don't know I would say almost love that she felt toward toward her um, her students and her colleagues it was really it, it seems more unusual every year that she's gone yeah yeah that's a good point because these things are scattered yeah in everybody's files so kind of piggy piggybacking <laughs> off of your question, um, and also slightly a selfish question. Um, so we're talking about the workshop, and I mean even like IU as a grader being this very warm, fuzzy, collaborative uh, environment that isn't a lot of other places. Um, how can we as scholars and me as a young PhD student? try and extend that kindness and gentleness into, um, from all of your perspectives that have had the ability to work in such an environment into a field that is often um, pushing for publications over quality relationships, um, where the award is not given to those who treat each other best, but to those who publish most. So what are, you talked about doing it with your students, what are some helpful steps kind of make academia a bit more gentle because it can't be. It's precisely, we have a lab meeting in a couple of weeks that we're going to try to talk about this because I don't, I mean, because we, we sort of recognize we have this great culture like in our lab that, mm -hmm. but our students sometimes, well, they go to conferences and they're like, what's this? You know, it's not, it's, and, and some of it's not bad. I mean, it's not bad to hear critiques and it, Sometimes those critiques are not as worded as kindly as they might be in someone who's your friend, but they're not bad. But other things are just not not the way they should be. People don't need to be as brusque. They don't need to not pay attention to your paper if they know you're a grad student. They don't need to leave the room if they're like, oh, this is boring. And I don't know. I'm hoping that we have some amazing answers in two weeks from now. But I mean, because you, of course, you yourself can, of course, bring that. But you are in the position of power and that's hard to try to be pushing upwards all the time and it can disadvantage you I mean you need to do it we as, as more senior scholars need to do it what else yeah no I think that um, I think that you're right and um, I think uh, individually um, trying to be a good mentor which means um, it isn't that there weren't egos shown at the workshop, but um, there was always this sense of common good. And um, I think that you can take that in your own personal life and how you relate and interact with the people you engage with fellow graduate students um, and then eventually your own students, how you conduct your classes, how you devote time to them, and that it isn't about you. It's about what uh, 
the larger goal that you're trying to. And then I agree with you, it's about senior leadership and <laughs> Lauren and I have been talking as uh, heads of programs of how to work on cultures that will then be more supportive and nurturing of the people within those programs. And I think um, it takes a willingness <coughs> to say, okay, we're gonna try this. We're gonna go and do a trust workshop <laughs> or we're going to, uh, we're gonna step outside of ourselves and just see what happens. So support any kind of activity that you see that's in that vein. So I have Jimmy, Scott, Aurelian. Maybe just a couple of quick comments. So first I, I just realized that uh, Mike and I and Adela came about the same time. We've got a couple of years of each other. And I don't think there's anybody here that before us. <laughs> um, so I was just a graduate student. <laughs> I was trying to quit being a graduate student. <laughs> so, um, so here's the first point. Um, Len had this nurturing side to it, there's no doubt. So what I'm going to get into is, so we don't really know Len and Vincent prior to 1980. That's going to be my first one. And I suspect that Len had this nurturing side to her all along. But we also don't know to what extent, I mean, I'm going to, now I'm going to focus on collaboration. And I think what happened with Len as a student of Vincent, and then Vincent and Len as partners in life, really comes about as a collaboration and I think they shaped each other and what I think you know it, it, you know that going back to governing the commons this <coughs> um, when Lynn um, writes something on the lines of this is dedicated to, to Vincent because of this contestation I think that's in a way I suspect that's a lot of the building early building blocks of their learning to work together, but Lynn's also developing this idea of collaboration and the gains that come out of collaboration. So, so I think, and I know the early days of the workshop were about collaborations that they had with a few other faculty on campus to sit down, read each other's work, and collaborate. So I think a lot of the workshop is about collaboration, and you have a lab, we have a lab, but I think the workshop is a lab, or was a lab, or is a lab. And I think it could have easily just have been the laboratory at work and laboratory and political theory and policy analysis. So I'm going to get to is I think we'll look where collaborations work the best, whether it's social sciences or whether it's physical, whether it's chemistry or biology, is when you have a laboratory environment where you have to work together and you have multiple projects going on. And that's where you start, that either falls apart and doesn't go anywhere, or you learn how to do this collaboration, which leads to higher productivity. The people working along. So what I, the other side of this, going back to grants, is Lynn definitely though had an entrepreneurship and are willing to push on that side that Vincent didn't have, I think. Uh, and so that's kind of this unique side to her, I think. And she was, uh, even though I think their collaboration allowed her this opportunity to do a lot of these things. That's the side to her that more than almost any of us have, I think. She was willing to push the push the envelope in some sense on going after grants, working on new projects, bringing in new methodologies. And that was a side to her that then led to the growth in the, what, the, the development of the workshop in some sense. So I think it really is though about, you know, going back to working together. Mm -hmm. You don't have a culture of working together if you don't have good collaborations. If you have good collaborations, they will continue working year after year after year, uh, whereas otherwise you don't. And the good news, I think, in academics is that, the, you know, Early, early years, let's say go back to the 50s and 60s or before, so much science was, at least in the social sciences, was single author. <laughs> and so much of it now is, it's accepted that these, of these collaborations. So that's a good thing to, to work for, mm -hmm. to have as a knowledge. So. And let me just say my pessimism before was just a propagation. It's not really deeply <laughs> held. <laughs> I'm just trying to get us to think about it. Uh -huh. Welcome. Yeah, and um, and having you and Roy as uh, two of uh, the collaborators.
collaborators on the CPR project, working on what it means to work with public goods and common pool resources and bringing in the game theory and the lab experiments, I think really was pretty profound. But and that was, Lynn's entrepreneurship led to that. We, we had those skills, but she pushed the envelope toward making this come together. No, no I, no com I completely agree with that, but you were open to it. Right. And you accepted no, the invitation mm -hmm. and to see what was going to happen. And, uh, and I'd say um, rules, games, and common pool resources is a classic. I encountered many um, scholars from different disciplines or different subfields and different subfields within political science who still point to that and say this is how a research group should present their work. Is you know you have those theory chapters and then you have all of the different methods to addressing those questions. Mm -hmm. right? It's something to be still today, I think, to be aspired to, to do that kind of work. But the book would not have happened if Lynn hadn't been in the back pushing and pushing, and which is, <laughs> right. goes back to a lot of that, all of our experiences. Yeah, so. yeah. And it goes actually to a question that Lauren asked us in our list, and that was, is mixed methods still possible? And um, I think that Lynn really demonstrated how to appropriately use mixed methods mm -hmm. instead of just tacking on <laughs> things <laughs> to make it look like it's mixed methods, but that they actually they work together. And, uh, so yes, there's still need for that. Dan, was it a two finger? Because they got a long list ahead of you. Yeah, it was just about go, about <laughs> which I think is. Lynn's most underrated mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. by far. Jimmy and Roy were obviously uh, major reasons for that. But the book actually contains what is sort of, in a way, maybe an ultimate lesson from Lynn's work and the nature of the workshop, that it all comes down to levels of trust, ultimately. Right? Mutual trust between people builds higher levels of cooperation, which enables collective action and which is true in research <laughs> collaborations. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. That's why we had our trust workshop. Um, <laughs> Scott. It's the most important resource. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much again, Lauren and Dan and Aurelian for putting this together, and Adela and Gwen for coming out. It's fantastic. Um, we're trying to do a lot of outreach in particular, but because of all the anniversaries, the 10 year for the Nobel, 30 years for governing the commons this year. So we're doing a lot of really cool, I think, stuff coming up with that, including with IASC later this fall. Uh, but one thing that we're trying to do as well is engage kind of the next generation. Um, and we're working with IU Press to actually do a children's book about Lynn's life um, called Lynn's Uncommon Life. So it's in an early stage right now. But I have three daughters and I've been reading a lot of these Rebel Girls books to them, you know. So Emily Council now actually trying to take a stab at the first draft, but we'll be circulating it for lots of comments. But I found this to be helpful among other reasons because I think you distill down some really useful themes like scholarship as craftsmanship and this problem solving approach. We're already playing with challenging conventional wisdom and overcoming various hurdles, of course, but um, it doesn't have to be now, but I'm wondering, you know, reflecting back on your time, are there particular other, like, life lessons or, you know, even thinking of scenes, because we haven't nailed down illustrators even at this point, but if you have any thoughts along those lines now or, or any of you or in the future, I'd, we'd love to hear them. I mean, you know, I love that it's mine that, I mean, Lynn was just always so curious and so excited. I mean, every so, okay, every so often there was a presenter who she'd like listen to for a little while and then she'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> every so often. So it wasn't universal. Right, right, every so often it was students. But most of the time, like, she just got, she just got so excited about things. And she's like, oh, you can look at this. Isn't that a great puzzle? And like, just like, it was, it was, I think a children's book is great because in some ways that's all, it's almost like a childlike enthusiasm. Yeah. Coupled with an amazingly sophisticated brain that she never got tired of think, like looking at a puzzle. That's so. That's so interesting. And how did they do that? Like, how, what was the struggle that they encountered? How did they get past it? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's absolutely right. The other anniversary I'd point out, oh, yeah. and I'm not sure how how you'd want to tie Lynn into it. Is it's a uh, hundred years of women's suffrage yeah. mm -hmm. this year, mm -hmm. which I think is also important. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I agree with you. She's always excited by the puzzle, and I would say, yeah. Lynn made everybody around her better. 
and um, and if you came to work with her, <laughs> you were going to be better. And I would say that her secret sauce <laughs> was joy. Mm -hmm. She brought a real joy to everything that she did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really attractive to people yeah. and uh, attracted people to her. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of hard work and we were all serious scholars, but there was also a lot of laughter <laughs> and joy in this work. The very first wow that we put on, <laughs> we toasted Vincent. No, I mean, we roasted Vincent. We also toasted him. We roasted Vincent. And so there's this long running joke of the pink Vincent. And uh, somehow he got lost in the basement here. But anyway, but so it wasn't just, you know, you guys know how the wows are that we all get together and we do our, we present our research and we work together and we take one another seriously. But then, at least at the and with these later wows too, the first wow, we also had time for fun and to poke fun of one another and to tell jokes and to, on one another and to uh, do things. At another, was it another wow? It was, wasn't it, where we had the hootenanny? Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and we had the tambourine. tambourine. Yeah, live on the tambourine. <laughs> <laughs> we had singing and dancing and, and so there was that piece of it, too. There's a real yeah. joy and um, that's another important part of Christmas making parties. collaborations work. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh my gosh, I was Santa one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have Aurelian, Barb, Jessica, yeah. And, um, you, can, you can take two questions at the same time. Okay. So it may be that to give us that. Uh, okay. I like I like puzzles, okay. I like constructive ideas. So that's a good idea with IU press. Okay. Here are the puzzles for all, all of us. One, is the label Bloomington School something we should invest in? And how, if so, how should we go about doing it? Number two, Lee Nordstrom doesn't have an, a, a chair in political science, a, na a named endowed chair in political science. Is it worth fighting for? And if so, how do we go about doing it? Those are my two puzzles. Mm -hmm. And I'm committed to both of them, but I'd like to hear from others. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be better if it was economic. We can have two, but we want much more. It's going to be more useful if economists paid attention to it. <laughs> That's a question. These are questions for everyone. Any thoughts? We keep cooking on it. We'll keep cooking okay. on that. So for label your and chair. Label and chair. LC. <laughs> Yes, this was really great for me to be able to hear what it was like to be able to have the opportunity to work with Eleanor or Lynn. Um, what I just wanted to offer the group is I come from this from a very different vantage point because I didn't have the opportunity to work with Lynn. Um, I, um, I experienced coming here in a different way that I thought might be helpful to share with the group and therefore may go toward answering your question about how you could facilitate this. Um, a little younger than Lynn, but old enough that in my career I've experienced gender discrimination at several jobs. And coming to academia was late for me. I came from the private sector. And I too, because I was not from the bottom up academia, I too had some real surprises when I did come to academia as a career change and seeing what the environment was like. And I was more surprised about <clears throat> how certain norms that I thought at least we did in business, you guys don't even do in academia. So I had some real negative experience early on. And um, was an academic very short at Michigan State, went to the FCC to get out and got recruited here and reluctantly tried again. And I mean it, tried academia again. And I have to say probably the best thing that ever happened to me was coming to this campus and finding the Ulster Workshop because this is the one place where I felt safe. Where I felt safe on so many levels that it didn't matter, male, female, it didn't matter what your field was. It was inherently interdisciplinary and it was in, and welcome. And when I started, I mean, Mike was the one who even told me that such a thing existed. <laughs> And I started coming when Lynn was still here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And although I didn't get to know her well, she was always so gracious 
accepting. And here I was coming from telecom, which at this point, around what was it, 08 or something? The workshop hadn't even gotten into the commons of physical infrastructures, which was my gig. Okay, but it was kind of, but I saw the potential. Wow, you're doing common stuff, but more natural resources here, maybe potentially we could get into governance of these other kind of structures. This has been a wonderful experience for me to be able to share, start coming to Postrum, being welcomed member of coming to this group. And now the workshop actually has grown and established two new programs. One in cybersecurity, one in data governance, which is now bridging where my area of interests are. I don't have any other place where this could happen, <laughs> to be honest with you. So I came in to academia under unusual timeline compared to other people. And I just want to say part of paying it forward is being able to continue the openness, collaboration, the welcomeness, as you all described, about being critical, tough, but with integrity and respect and with caring. So it's good research, it's collaborative. You don't take schlocky work, but you don't beat people down. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is of all, and I've worked, like I said, in private sector, government, academia. Um, in academia, and working like I, I don't know another group that has this same culture right now, just personally. But to me, part of continuing the legacy the Ostroms is to facilitate that, whether it's as we're working on right now, how to facilitate continuing this in a post Ostrom world, you know, because they've passed on. So how do we still try and maintain that going on? And how do you carry that to other groups? I'm trying to integrate media school. And even that changed when I came here with the telecom department. <laughs> now it's media school, but trying to, and, it, and this has been a very welcoming place, Good. you know, and with speed and everything like that. So, I just trying to show that in that way, I very much appreciate the legacy of the Ostroms, even though I didn't have the same opportunity you did to work that way. But believe me, it carries forward in how this continues to function. So I just wanted to express that, and that's another vantage point and kind of experience that people can have. And so allowing people to get the chance to look at them personally, allowing them to also, though, feel and benefit from the foundations they built is really important. And that's what you can do now as you go to these other schools and now you're doing these other programs as you're talking about. You can spread the same kind of culture, norms, things. So I just wanted to ship that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it's really important. I remember sitting around this table at one point when OVPR or somebody was trying to talk to a bunch of workshoppers to try to figure out this was post Lynn and Vincent. What is it that we do? And it was about like, what do you study? Like, what is it this research center studies? Like, what, what are you going to do going forward now? And a lot of us were talking about it's not just what we study, it's how we do it. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and that was harder for some people to get. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Um, we have Jessica and Godfrey. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so I had a really quick question for those of you that have spent a lot of time out there, because like Barb, I did not, I think I met her once or twice, bathroom and AXA. <laughs> 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 I really want to say hi, but this would be so awkward. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, so that might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one question I had is, you know, like all of the things that I've learned, like listening really to everybody in this room talk about their experiences with her is like, these characteristics she had and skills that she had to govern both herself, but the the sort of like way in which people around her interacted with respect to like collaboration and work. And, and that's like a skill set. It's also character, but it's a skill set. And I'm curious, like, did particularly both of you, but also other people in the room, experience her as learning at some point? In other words, like, those are things that I imagine when she <coughs> arrived. I don't know if she didn't have or had them when she arrived here, but. At different times in our lives and careers, we change and adapt and learn mm -hmm. things, and it determines how we interact with other people in ways that n none of us are sort of static, right? And so I'm sort of curious as to like if or how you experience your sort of learning this. 
things, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have interacted with that person this way, or this research group will work better now that I know this thing, or I don't know. I was just sort of curious about the sort of dynamism of mm -hmm. that process while you guys were working. Mm -hmm. Any growing pain, learning curve? <laughs> I think we're we're not that old. We're not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we know that. I mean, Lynn certainly told us that she had a stuttering problem when she was young mm -hmm. and she was on the debate. Mm -hmm. In high school, huh. I think probably we put that in the book. Being on a debate, <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. I'm serious. It's probably part of it. Um, I think, but how do you become just a really nice person? I think it probably goes back to Here. growing up with her mother being very poor and a lot of other those things like that. But yeah, it's tough to know. Um, and, and and a lot of it, I, I it's, it, we don't know. We don't know. That's what it comes down to. I mean, at some point. She thought the life she was living is not what she wanted to do, so she goes back to school, and that was a struggle at first. But we don't know who, become, other than the Vincents. And what's the, I, I will bring up really quickly, and I hope it's at the Lily Library. Is uh, I found a diary of theirs it was in their car when I was dealing with all their stuff, and that diary is about just road trips they were. I was going to say, is it the gas they buy? Because that's what my uncle Sorry? <laughs> is it the gas yeah, they buy oh, yeah. and the miles they went? Oh, it's great. actually little stories and the stories about when they bought some of the artwork they bought. And, and, oh, I, I, yeah, I, I hope it's at the Little Library. Um, Emily might know it. They're supposed to be. But maybe that's some insights, too. Uh, that's good to know, Jimmy, because we're in the process of doing little tombstones for the artwork around the workshop, so we need to find like, that diary. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's just some quick story. After they both passed away, I don't never going through the house, <laughs> and as we all know, it's something kind of like I do now. I wear the same thing all the time, <laughs> all the clothes. And Lynn pretty much had one or two outfits. That was just Lynn. <laughs> Her, clo her closets were full of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and so and a lot of things went to the theater department. A lot of things like that. We were like, whoa. You know. Nothing ever left that house. What? Nothing ever left that house. <laughs> it's true. Nothing ever left that house. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, so there's also maybe an early side. That's kind of my point earlier. Maybe there's an early side we just didn't know. But even when she was director, co-directing co the workshop, like were there times where maybe something didn't work, or like you, like did she ever make mistakes, or like you know you saw like a rough patch, and then things sort of there was adaptation. Was, I'm sure, or, she was constantly frustrated with OEPR and my <laughs> oh yeah, more about that than I do. Um, she and I and Roy working together. Yeah, there were times. Like, what did you say? Why did you write it this way? And, but that was just part of the collaboration. Yeah. We got along. I did see a little bit of her sort of learning sort of a new area uh, when the F when she first started working on the SES framework. And, uh, there was a group of mostly European scholars that we called the SES Club that was trying to. I think it was about the time that, that I first yeah. reached out to Barbara because uh, they were trying to apply similar sorts of ideas to uh, uh, highly sophisticated technical systems like power grids and those kinds. Of uh, and so it was very different setting than the relatively local uh, uh, resource systems or even the, the larger fisheries and, and added and not the climate chasing. It was just it was very highly technical and there's not a lot of it's not quite clear where technological change fits in the ID framework. I mean that that's just not not very well sort of handled. And so there was a lot of discussion back and forth between you know, people who were trained as engineers and stuff like that, uh, and, and systems modelers and things like that. And I don't think we ever quite came to a conclusion of whether the SES framework as it was was broad enough to incorporate that or whether you needed a social, tech, socio technical uh, um, um, environmental sort of system and all of that. And that that there was a real struggle for her to sort of get, get her mind around that. Uh, and a similar, about the same time, we also had some folks, um, uh, Conrad Hagedorn, particularly from, mm -hmm. from um, 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 Humboldt in Germany, uh, trying to bring agricultural economics into this full, full scale uh, and uh, sort of a transaction cost approach to, to economics. And again, it just didn't quite fit. So there was this effort to try to bring these pieces together. Now, it was relatively late in Lynn's career. 
uh, uh, and she had so many other things sort of going on. But it was fascinating. She was very open to learning. Uh, but <coughs> there were limits to what she wanted to learn. And every <laughs> once in a while, a grad student would talk about, well, you know, there's aspects of this that sounds a little bit like um, uh, uh, who's the uh, culturation, uh, uh, structuration guy Giddens, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. And it's like, <laughs> you know, no, there, there were there were limits beyond what's the sort of you know, barriers. You know, you get too far away from methodological individualism. So it was kind of interesting to sort of see the barriers. But they were very open to that. But it's it's you know, there there were limits to to what she was sort of willing to sort of incorporate with it. And it, it, another point on that is the design principle. She was always very reluctant when someone would take the design principle. And say, ah, now I have the answer to blah blah blah. blah, blah. Uh, she, she just always resisted that, and, and uh, she wanted them to say, what's your problem? What's the problem you're looking at? How have people struggled with this in the past? Uh, what's worked? What hasn't worked? You know, and come and get some sort of conclusion. So she was always kind of trying to resist that this was the one way of putting things together. So, but I remember we had a working group on social evolution uh, and uh, evolutionary theory may actually be applied sort of at the group level and how that was a very complicated thing and we read a lot of biology and stuff like that and, and, and learned a lot and she was very open to learning in that so uh, it was it was just kind of fascinating to see her see her mind work and I also say it was fascinating to see the way she worked around administrators. Uh, and deans and directors and things like that. And so it gave me lots of, of um, insights into the games that various scholars were playing against me when I was an associate dean. <laughs> <laughs> That's going. And, and there were only one or two who were about as good at it as Lynn was. Lynn was a master. <laughs> she didn't always succeed either. She didn't always succeed, no. But, it was, it was, you talk about mentoring, I, I got this like practicum in, in how to be an administrator just by going to meetings with LBR administrators. So I think we have one, time for one last question, which uh, we'll thanks, get to. Thanks time. for organizing this conversation. So I have two questions. The first one, I would, I would like to know whether and how the Nobel Prize changed me. Hmm. Uh, the second one, I've always wondered why, you know, the model should be Involved, you know, got more complicated. Right? The ideas, you know, a little bit simpler than the other model she was evolving later. And I've already wondered, I've already wondered, like I've, I've never got a restriction on why she felt the need to complicate her explanation. I mean, I think answering the second question first, the IAD framework. <laughs> And when also coupled with the design principles, it started with the design principles, right? They, it was all, it was how do communities manage, manage themselves off and apply to resources, but there really wasn't much about resources in the design principles. And then in the IAD, there was a box for the biophysical world. But so many of the problems that she, she and other scholars at the workshop were interested in studying were about the biophysical world. And the more that they studied them and the more that they interacted um, with ecologists like Bernie and others, and the more that they, learned about natural systems, I think they realized that had, that box needed to be elaborated. And that box, and what happened in that box affected a lot of other boxes in the IAD, such that it gave birth to the SES. And perhaps the SES is too complicated. I mean, I was in one of those, some of those SES working groups where we have the, the layers and the layers, yeah, and, the, yeah. and, we're trying, and I was like, I don't, I don't know if this, is, if this is workable. And I think people still struggle with it, but I think the recognition was so simple. It, it was too simple. To, to capture these, these complex biophysical phenomena. As far as how the Nobel changed, or others, I mean, I was a student, others can answer better. I mean, I, I, she still had time for me, but she was so much busier. I think it was very stressful. I mean, I remember her being very stressed, and sort of, at one point, like, Nicole had to hug her, like, she's just like, this is too much, like, mm -hmm. and I, I think it was just really hard. Um, I'm sure that there, obviously, there are many, many good things, but I think, I think personally, it was very hard. Particularly disliked how people stopped challenging her after she got the prize. <laughs> I, I I agree with when it didn't change much except maybe she had even more distractions or more things going on. 
but there was one significant change I, I noticed. She started talking about, overtly talking about the problems she had when she first started out hmm. as a woman in, in academia, mm -hmm. and, and someone who had been discouraged from getting a PhD in economics at the time because, you know, you already got a business degree, and you're already a business person, why do you want to do that? And even in political science, the problems and the way she was hired here, and the jobs, she, the courses she was supposed to teach, Saturday mornings and stuff like that. Um, Which is why she, I always think of her as a feminist. Yeah, well see, she, she played that card, but, but she played it extremely well. I mean, I remember I saw her the first time when, right after the prize, she had a press conference with with President McRobbie, and, and he was sitting there hearing the stuff about the courses he had to teach when he came in. And I see him thinking, hey, I want to hear, go play with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but she was doing it in a very joyful, sort of pleasant yeah. Yeah. sort of way, you know. Uh, but, um, no, I think at that point, the fact of being appointed the first, econom first woman economist to get that prize, I think gave her a little bit of sense that she was a little more path-breaking in that sense than she saw herself before. I think I don't think mm -hmm. she really saw herself in that way. I think she, I do think she had a special attraction to working with women students. I think she was just very, very good working with women students, and um, it just seemed that way. There was a natural rapport there, and she protected them and, and supported them very, very well. But I think she got a little more. Confident, of, she sort of, she had this opportunity now to, to get people's attention. Uh, this, this is a proud woman, you know, and and don't think this thing is solved. That this is, you know, this is. I mean, she would say, "Why am I the first one to get this?" I mean, there's a lot of good mm -hmm. economists that have been women, you know, and, and so that was the one thing I think that, that she changed a little bit, and it was more sort of taking advantage of the situation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of working with people and listening to students and. She was same old Lynn. She was a, she'd always been a very ordinary person in some sense, and she could really interact with her on a, on a human to human basis. She wasn't off on some pedestal somewhere. That did not change one bit. Mm -hmm. On a lighter note, uh, ex with the exception of Bob Dylan, she may have had the biggest effect on the Nobel as opposed to an effect on her. So uh, she was such a casual yeah, person, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there were people concerned. <laughs> Uh, is this going to fit right? And she, the dress she's going to wear? Oh, is it going to go out? And in the end, she was the star of the show. Yes, she and so uh, she didn't like uh, at, at the Nobel. All these people want uh, they, they want the uh, autographs of all these Nobel winners, so they go off and sell them. No way. She wouldn't have anything to do with it. She was she was just Lynn in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. my sense is that the people like here, uh, the people at the People that were part of this process, this Nobel, they really got, they became friends with her. Yeah. Sense. And so, in that sense, I think she may be affected. Mm -hmm. But also, go, going back to an earlier comment, if you there were, were ways to piss her off. And if you really wanted to piss her off, be not nice to the staff. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. That's exactly right. We were always nice, so. <laughs> Those of us who stayed. Well, so, so in terms of the Nobel, we'll keep talking. We want to encourage everyone to stay. The reception is, is right out here, right? Um, so there's, um, please stay and keep having conversations. And uh, thank you so much for both of you coming all this way, especially on a snowy day from the West. We really appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes. 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 Yes.